Okay, so y I mentioned earlier that our guest speaker this evening holds the Michael A. Walker Chair at the Fraser Institute. You may ask yourself, who is Michael Walker? Michael Walker, when, I, when, when we had the idea of starting the Institute, the first phone call that I made was to Canada and to the very same Michael Walker. He was the founder of the Fraser Institute in Vancouver. In the first wave of think tanks, when the term was first invented, the original free market think tank was the Institute of Economic Affairs in Britain. And there was a gentleman named Anthony Fisher who supported the founding of that, and then the first American one. And among the early ones was then the Canadian one, the Fraser Institute. And they've been a tremendous supporter of the Lion Rock Institute since we got started, since that first phone call when Michael Walker said, Andrew, this is how you start a think tank. And years later, Fred McMahon joined the organization, and since then, he has really taken over the Freedom Index. And he travels the world explaining the importance to freedom to people and why it is important. And there's always a little bit of something different every year. Um, if you go to the Fraser Institute in Vancouver, in their boardroom, they have a huge uh, wooden carving that one of their donors made for them. And it says on there, and Fred, tell me if it's, I believe it should still be there. It's never going to go anywhere. And it says, if it matters, measure it. Freedom matters. And the Fraser Institute measures it. And the person that runs that project and explains it to the world is our guest speaker tonight. Please help me welcome from the Fraser Institute, Mr. Fred McMahon. Well, thank you, Andrew. Thank you. All right, it's all yours. Well, Andrew, thank you for that uh, generous uh, introduction. Uh, coming all the way here from a very cold Canada right now to Hong Kong, my favorite place in the world, is actually a tremendous privilege. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Lion Rock Institute and the profound work they do for inviting me here. I, I had a list of people to thank and congratulate, but between the previous speakers, Andrew and Peter, uh, all of them were thanked, but I can't tell you how lucky Hong Kong is to have such a competent, even inspired and dedicated group of people working to improve Hong Kong, to maintain and increase the freedom which this most marvelous place on the planet enjoys. I'm here to talk about Hong Kong's overall and profound achievement in freedom, but the focus is on economic freedom. This is the classic definition of economic freedom. Individuals have economic freedom when the property they acquire without the use of force, fraud, or theft is protected from physical invasion by others, and they are free to use, exchange, or give their property so long as their actions do not violate the identical rights of others. What this boils down to is the ability of individuals and families to make their own economic decisions, free of crony capitalists, paternalist elites, and huge government. We use 42 independent objective variables, so our subjective thoughts do not influence the uh, index, to create our index of economic freedom which the Nobel laureate Douglas North has called the best available description of efficient markets. Size of government. If government taxes away too much of your property, it reduces your economic freedom. If it spends too much, regardless of how it gets the resources, it reduces the space for free exchange. Private property and the rule of law. This is the fundamental infrastructure of economic freedom. Without the protection of private property, without the rule of law, the rich and the powerful take advantage of their own positions to enrich and empower themselves by reducing other people's economic freedom. Sound money, inflation can be taxation. Trade, Hong Kong more than any other place on the planet understands that you need the world as your marketplace. Regulation of business, labor, and capital markets you should be able to start a business when you wish and close it when you wish. You should be able to hire whom you wish and work for whom you wish. You should be able to borrow from whom you wish and lend to whom you wish. And believe it or not, these things are complicated and difficult in too many parts of the planet. Maintaining 
poverty and suppressing prosperity. Talk about making a difference. As Andrew mentioned, Michael Walker started this over 30 years ago. We now have 100 partner institutes in over 90 nations and territories working for the economic freedom of their people. And this is only a partial list. And now that you've had time to read it, we'll <laughs> carry on. The, I am glad to present to you the results of the 2005 Economic Freedom of the World Index. And as no surprise, Hong Kong is number one as it has been in every year that we have data. By the way, you were probably quite astonished by those technical uh, details. You think I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars producing that spinning sign? No, I did it all myself. Um, this is the top 10 in economic freedom. But as I mentioned, I'm not just going to talk about economic freedom, I'm going to talk about overall freedom. And Hong Kong, while it may not be number one in civil and personal freedoms, is in the top six ahead of France, the United States, and well ahead of Singapore. What my institute, the Fraser Institute, in cooperation with the Cato Institute in the United States and the Friedrich Schaumann Foundation for Freedom in Germany have done is produce the first ever index that measures all dimensions of freedom, economic freedom, civil freedom, the freedom of association. And when you put them all together, I'm glad to tell you that Hong Kong is number one in overall freedom too. Now, I'm really hoping that there's a place on the planet that will learn from Hong Kong. I hope Beijing will learn from Hong Kong rather than the reverse. <laughs> China is 111th, 111th in economic freedom. You know, people talk about the Chinese uh, miracle. It's really not a miracle. When you go from a level of absolutely abysmal policy to just bad policy, you rapidly move up and you have a great spurt of growth as you go from one level to another. But unless you maintain that reform, you get trapped in a lower level of income. It's called the middle income trap, and China needs to keep reforming. China is 135th in personal freedom. China is 132nd in overall human freedom. You couldn't think of a greater contrast between China and Hong Kong. So here's hoping Beijing learns from Hong Kong. Why is economic freedom important? Well, we often talk about prosperity. And all you have to do is look over this marvelous, glittering city of Hong Kong, which was a wreck after the Second World War, devastated under colonial rule. And look what you have today. That in and of itself, just a visual glance around, shows the profound effect of economic freedom on prosperity. But economic freedom extends far beyond that, and these are things that we should talk about too, because it's not just prosperity. Economic freedom changes the whole dynamic of a society. Without economic freedom, with an all-powerful government or an all-powerful elite or crony capitalist, you have to win to have opportunity. It has to be your party in power, your ethnic group in power, your religious group in power, your tribe in power, because it's winner take all. If your group's in power, you get the job opportunities. You get the promotion. You get the permission to move and travel. You get to send your children to higher education. 
But if your group is out of power, you're denied jobs, you're denied promotions, you're denied opportunity. You live in a dimmer world. And this sets group against group, sect against sect. We can see this most tragically in the Arab world right now, but it's not unique to the Arab world. Economic freedom changes all of that. It's not a miracle overnight, but it's a miracle over time. You have to be the best. You have to produce products and services that people voluntarily want to buy. That means you have to hire good employees. It means you have to have good suppliers, not suppliers from the dominant tribe or sect, but good suppliers because you're competing in the free market. What it means is your employees are from other groups. Your employers are from other groups. Your suppliers are from other groups. It cuts across all of these lines. I think that's one of the reasons why Hong Kong and even Singapore managed to escape many of the evils of post-colonial uh, societies. When you look around the world today, the most tolerant societies, virtually without exception, are the economically free societies. We're going to take a look at some snapshots in time. These don't prove anything. They're simple correlations. But what they do reflect is a massive body of research on economic freedom, more than 500 academic peer-reviewed articles and policy articles. So we've already talked about the impact on prosperity. The quarter freest economically, the quarter most free economic nations have an average per capita income of close to $40,000 a year under $6,000 a year for the least free. But you know, some of our friends say, well, that doesn't matter because it's just the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer and the prosperity is all gobbled up by the rich. Well, economic freedom doesn't really change uh, distribution. The poorest 10% receive about 2.5 or less percent of national income in an economically free country and a non-economically uh, free country. An economist would call that a random walk. But again, there's a dynamic difference here. In a non-economically free nation, you become one of the 1% or 10% by restricting markets by making deals under the table, by keeping other people out, by creating monopolies for yourself. In other words, you become one of the elite by making people worse off. In a truly economically free place, marked by voluntary exchange, how do you get ahead? You get ahead by producing goods and services that other people voluntarily want to purchase and they voluntarily want to purchase it because it makes them better off. So you move from a society where you become one of the 1% or 10% by making people worse off to a society where you become one of the 1% or 10% by making people better off by producing goods and services that they want. That's a dramatic change in dynamics. But there's even another miracle here. And that is economic freedom produces such higher levels of prosperity that the poorest 10% in economically free nations have an average per capita income of $9,000 US per year, purchasing power adjusted. Uh, check the footnotes to my talk for purchasing power adjusted. Uh, and the least free have an income of just $1,000 a year. You know, I was just doing a number of speeches in Central America. The average income of the poorest 10% in economically free nations is three times the average income in Central America. And that's the poorest 10%. Economic freedom and other freedoms 
for the reasons and the dynamics I mentioned earlier, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but there's a very close correlation. Economic freedom and the impact on other indicators of well-being. Economic freedom and corruption. Lack of economic freedom is the raw material of corruption. If you need to ask somebody's permission to do something, there's someone to pay off. If a powerful person can create a monopoly or keep your competitors out, there's someone to pay off. If you can do deals under the table avoiding free exchange, there's someone to pay off. But if you don't have to ask anyone's permission, there's no one to pay off. If deals are done on the free market, there's no one to pay off. If competition is open to all, there's no one to pay off. You know, China has a big anti-corruption campaign going on now using police forces and so on. China would do much better to fight corruption by opening up to economic freedom and ending the raw material of corruption and seeing it start to wither away by natural market forces. Economic freedom and life satisfaction. This is one of my favorite charts. Our friends on the left and paternalistic elites like to say, well, how could anybody be happy um, in free markets, dog-eat-dog -dog, uh, world? What we're really interested in is happiness. Well, because of a number of new tools of measurement, there is now a substantial literature on life satisfaction or happiness. As it turns out, our socialist and paternalistic friends are wrong. People actually like to make their own decisions. They know what they want best, or they know what their family wants best. They like control of their lives. Economic freedom is a positive and powerful driver of individual happiness, even when you correct for income. So how, how is Hong Kong doing? Well, as was mentioned earlier, Hong Kong is actually doing fairly well, but it's doing fairly well because other nations are declining, other advanced nations. <laughs> so you don't see much of a gain there in Hong Kong, a little bit of up and down, but you can see decline in the other nations. Size of government, I want to talk about that a little bit later because there are some concerns there. But Hong Kong maintains its lead. Rule of law, in the long term, I'm quite concerned about the rule of law in Hong Kong. But to this point in time, and by the way, this data only goes to 2013, so it doesn't capture the last couple of years, the rule of law in Hong Kong has declined at about the same pace it has in Canada. In other words, not much. And it's declined far more dramatically in the United States. But this is the key thing to maintain here freedom to trade. Something curious is going on here. Hong Kong has dipped a little bit, and it's because of non-tariff barriers. This is something uh, that uh, policymakers should investigate. Regulation in Hong Kong is still doing rather well. But for a number of reasons, economic freedom is hard to maintain. As countries get rich, governments and special interest groups get greedy and want more and more. Now I'm going to show you some charts over an historical time period. One of the challenges here is it's hard to get long time series on economic data. I'll be using size of government simply because that's the best available. And it's not going to have all the nations I want, and it's not going to have all the time periods I want. But when you graph time series onto each other, you can often get a distorted picture. So this is just a select group of nations, unfortunately only up to the mid-1990s, but I wanted to keep this consistent. This is overall government and France, and as you can see, and this is true of all rich countries, except Hong Kong and Singapore to some extent to this point, constant growth in the size of government. Uh, the United States, for all its flaws, remains the most dynamic of the large free market economies, and they've resisted, better than most, the uh, growth of government. 
This is just government consumption, but it pays itself. Again, you see the same pattern. Sweden got really out of control. Uh, by the way, it's getting back under control. And this is transfer payments and subsidies. These create constituencies that demand their, and you, as you can see, it's the same pattern, constantly up, almost like an irresistible force. Now, most of these have plateaued out, and some of them, like uh, the Netherlands, have moved back. But it's almost an act of nature that Hong Kong, and it's not just size of government, it's regulation and other things, that Hong Kong, just as was mentioned earlier, Hong Kong has done better because other nations have declined. If you want to maintain this sparkling city, you've got to be aware of this. And it is key to avoid bad policy. There are some politicians who say, anytime there's a problem, we've got to fix it. We look bad if we don't fix it. Or it's nihilistic if we don't fix it. Well, oftentimes, they don't have a clue about how to fix it. It's like they're driving a car and the car breaks down and they say, oh, well, we can't draw, call a garage a private sector. We've got to fix it ourselves. They start with a Mercedes and end up with a Model T Ford by fixing it themselves. These often create perverse incentives. I'll just give an example from my part of the country. There was a problem. Atlanta County, where I'm from, had a higher than average unemployment rate. So the government said we can't do, sorry, we can't just sit back and let that happen. We'll have to do something. So they created a system called unemployment insurance. Help the people of Atlanta, Canada. Help people where I'm from. What did it do? It made being unemployed more profitable than being employed for most people. Unemployment rate in Atlantic Canada, this thing to solve unemployment, unemployment rate tripled after this policy was introduced. But that's only with the official statistics. So many people left the workforce to collect unemployment that real unemployment quadrupled. So beware of perverse consequences. There's also a problem with putting in universal programs. One, I'm one of those, by the way, who believes that government should help the worst off. That there is a responsibility there. But universal programs are the worst way to do it. They typically give most of their benefits to the already affluent. Structures of tax codes and so on often mean that everything is taxed away from poor people, but it benefits rich or affluent people. Even worse, it creates, we've been talking about perverse incentives, perverse incentives to maintain it in place. You get a universal system, everybody's a recipient. <laughs> so you get a 100% lobby group in favor uh, of it. Yes, help the poor, but be careful of perverse systems that, as you saw from the earlier graphs, are very hard to take out or reform. Economic freedom is a precious commodity. Gold is a commodity. If economic freedom were a commodity like gold, Hong Kong would be sitting on the richest gold mine in the world. Don't shut it down. Maintain your freedom. It's a huge challenge for the future, and thank goodness Lion Rock is here to keep up the battle. Thank you so much.